Excellent, yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, we can start. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, special uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, Fellow uh, seminar. Uh, today's uh, presentation will be by uh, Dr. Amira Al Azmi. Uh, a quick uh, background on the uh, on the program, which was launched uh, in 2009, and this was uh, in collaboration with uh, King Fahd uh, University of Petroleum and Minerals, uh, KFUPM, um, in Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, it enrolled uh, the first uh, fellow in 2012. Um, in uh, 2018, uh, we have uh, renewed the contract uh, now with uh, CAXT, uh, NMIT, another 10 years, alhamdulillah. Uh, and uh, with the uh, current CAXT sponsorship to continue uh, the uh, work and collaboration with uh, the fellows. Um, and the, the main purpose is to uh, uh, empower the Saudi women to be leaders uh, in the future. Um, so the Ibn Khaldun uh, program uh, is highly competitive, uh, as you know, and it uh, brings uh, between five and 10 uh, female Saudi scientists and engineers that are selected. Um, first selection or the two selections that happen uh, simultaneously, one in Saudi Arabia by CAXT and the second one at MIT by MIT professors and, and staff uh, members. Um, and so for them to spend uh, one year to conduct research uh, at MIT uh, and across the Institute. Um, so uh, we are very proud of what the uh, fellows uh, have achieved, uh, the current ones and the previous uh, uh, fellows, um, and uh, not only in their scientific uh, contributions, but also in their leadership roles uh, that they are uh, making in many uh, disciplines, uh, including industry. Um, so today we introduce uh, 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 Dr. Amir's uh, faculty member uh, mentor, Professor Bouchet. Uh, he is a distinguished professor of chemical uh, engineering uh, here at MIT. Uh, a lot of his work. Uh, uh, involves uh, electrochemical uh, energy conversion, uh, storage, uh, microfluidics, um, uh, phenomena, uh, the uh, interfacial uh, phenomena, uh, catalysts, um, uh, synthesis, synthesis and, uh, and also tomography. So I thank him and also on behalf of our program for uh, um, working with uh, Amira and uh, guiding her uh, through the completion of, uh, of her program uh, at MIT. And I'm going to give the um, uh, stage to him, you know, to uh, uh, introduce her. Uh, Professor Bouchet. Excellent. Well, uh, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Hopefully you can hear me well. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amira Alazimi. Uh, uh, Amira got her PhD um, from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, studying under Professor Pedro uh, da Costa. Uh, her PhD was in chemical sciences, and she did some really quite beautiful work uh, advancing the synthesis of graphene. And I think you'll hear some of that uh, in her talk today and how it connected then to the work that she's doing now as an independent faculty member, as well as part of her uh, fellowship in our group. Uh, from after graduating, uh, Amira became an assistant professor in chemical sciences at the University of Hafer al Batin. I probably mispronounced that and I apologize, um, as well as serving as the dean, the vice dean of scientific research at the university. So uh, uh, quite, a, quite an important role um, in managing both university direction as well as direction of one's own independent lab. Uh, so you know, excellent work for her there. 
Um, through the fellowship that was just described, um, Amira was able to, to join my group uh, for the past year. And we were very excited to bring her in um, because of her expertise, uh, not just in graphene synthesis. She'll talk a little bit about how she brought that expertise into our group and we learned quite a bit um, from, her, uh, from her capabilities and were able to do some very interesting science. Um, but also her deep expertise in material analysis. We're a chemical engineering group. We are more users of materials than innovators and understanders of materials. And so Amira really helped us to up our game in that area and better understand um, how, to, uh, how to develop materials that would maybe advance our own technology interests. It, it, it's difficult not to talk about uh, the challenges associated with COVID-19 with us. Um, she had planned a conference presentation. Her work was successful enough that we wanted to um, give her the opportunity to present uh, in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, that fell on the wayside. Um, and also she had to leave a little bit earlier to return uh, to Saudi Arabia, but still maintain contact with us through the marvels of Zoom uh, and other internet connectivity. Um, so we were very grateful to have her while we could. Um, and I will make one note before I, I turn over the floor to her to tell you about all the wonderful science she did, but it's her home university was so pleased to have her back. They immediately promoted her to Dean of Scientific Research at that university. So I guess our loss uh, is, is their gain, um, but big congratulations to Amira. And I look forward to uh, hearing her uh, t tell you what she's been up to with us. Thank you, the floor is yours, Amira. Thank you, thank you, Professor Vic. Thank you all for uh, attending uh, this webinar. I'm very excited to share with you my experience during my fellowship uh, uh, at MIT. Uh, and thank you, Professor Vic, for the introduction again. I will start to share my screen. And uh, while I'm doing that, please, if you have any questions, uh, submit your question to the, um, to the chats, and then I will uh, answer the questions at the end of my presentation. Uh, so uh, actually, as uh, Professor Fick mentioned, uh, my work at MIT um, was, uh, was a continuous story of what I have done in my PhD. So I, I try to connect what I have learned with, uh, with the fellowship to, to get a, a, a deep advanced uh, understanding of the material that I'm working on. So I was exploring the texture of carbonaceous microparticles uh, as an electrocatalyst for vanadium redox batteries, uh, where uh, mainly I was working in two uh, main projects. Uh, the first one, exploring the impact of reduced graphene oxide surface texture as an uh, electrocatalyst and redox flow battery. And then the second project was again exploring the potential application uh, of uh, activated carbon uh, derived, from, uh, derived from the band date seeds for a uh, redox uh, flow uh, battery. Uh, speaking about the first project, actually since here I'm focusing on graphene and graphene oxide, we all know that graphene and reduced graphene oxide can be applied in several applications, for example, for supercapacitor, for um, screen touch devices, CO2 capture, and even for drag delivery. The question is how to make graphene. And actually to synthesis graphene, there is two main pathways. The first one actually is the chemical synthesis of graphene in one substrate. Uh, usually it's a transition metal. And one of the famous and most effective method to produce high quality graphene is actually the chemical vapor deposition uh, where uh, 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 the graphene chemically synthesized on the substrate, and we have a very good quality of graphene. I mean by quality, um, the monolayer graphene that we can obtain where we can maximize the properties of the graphene. However, this method is, um, is a highly cost, so it's, it's very expensive and it's um, not a scalable process. The other pathway to synthesize graphene is the mechanical uh, cleavage of graphite, the graphite that is existing in our nature, where actually the mechanical exfoliation was the first method to produce graphene uh, by um, exfoliating the graphite 
the, the natural graphite. However, the, the low throughput and the time consumption to, uh, to produce graphene using this method is limiting this method to be a practical method to be applied and producing large scale. Other alternative uh, method of, of uh, the chemical cleavage is the chemical synthesis of graphene from uh, oxidizing the, gra the, the natural graphite that we have in nature and then reduce it again to have reduced graphene oxide. However, this method produce a low quality graphene. The, the graphene produced uh, using this method is low. However, it's, um, it's a low cost uh, method to produce a graphene. And actually, this is why we are here focusing on this method, since it's cost-effective method, but we want to in increase the quality of the produced graphene. Uh, actually, uh, we look into the literature, and we can see that, and uh, if you are familiar with the field and uh, you have read uh, many publications, you will uh, hear about graphene oxide and reduce graphene oxide too much in the papers, but however, you can make graphene chemically using several methods, and you can reduce graphene oxide again using several methods. However, we haven't found any um, research publication that indicates the differences between uh, the synthesis of pr uh, procedure, how it's impact the final result uh, product, whether it's graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide. Like uh, the question here, are all the graphene oxides uh, has the same properties or, uh, that we are synthesizing using different method? Of course not. But we haven't seen any uh, like a, com uh, a comparison study um, uh, to study the uh, properties of the reduced graphene. And uh, here uh, was our motivation uh, to select two um, main synthesis um, uh, method of graphene oxide the most classical method, which is the Hammer method. And then the second method, it's the improved Hammer's method. And then the main difference between these two methods is that in the improved Hammer's method, we are eliminating the sodium nitrate, uh, sorry, sodium nitrate in order uh, to eliminate the toxic gas evolution during the synthesis. And also in the improved Hammer method, we are introducing phosphoric acid, which enhance the oxidation step. We are starting from the natural uh, graphite and we are oxidizing to have graphene oxide. And then also we have selected a three uh, classical reduction method, which is thermal reduction, the chemical reduction using hydrazine, and also hydrothermal reduction of uh, graphene oxide. We have selected the most common uh, uh, procedures in order to be uh, able to uh, compare the properties of the products. So this is what we have. We start graphite. We have HGO, which is from Hammer's method, IGO, which is from improved Hammer's method. And from each graphene oxide, we have a three reduced graphene oxide depending on the reduction method that we have used. And now, studying the material properties, actually, we can see that the graphite itself, the natural graphite, exhibited a compact and sharp edges morphology. While after the oxidation, we start to see the separation of the graphite basal grains. And the mass separation, we can clearly see it in, in case of IGO compared to the HGO. So the improved method has better separation of the graphite basal grains compared to the HGO. Upon the reduction, actually, um, all the material, all the reduced material, it's habited similar morphology. So we cannot speak uh, much about the morphology for the reduced graphene oxide here. Uh, and looking to the structure uh, and the face purity of the material that we synthesized, we have three form XRD, where actually we can see the graphite exhibited the characteristic graphite peak at around 28 degree. And then after the oxidation, this graphite peak has shifted toward lower two theta, which means the successful oxidation of the graphite. However, we have observed that the IGO has shifted towards 
مور لور تو ثيتا which indicates full uh, oxidation of the graphite compared to the HGO. Another indication from XRD is that we have a remaining graphite peak here. This indicates to us the HGO method doesn't fully oxidize the graphite material. After the reduction, we can see that the graphene oxide peak has shifted back towards the graphite uh, position, which means the material has been reduced. However, in general, we can see that the full width half maximum, in case of all IGO material, is larger than uh, the full width uh, half maximum uh, that related to the material produced from uh, HGO material. And this is give us indication that this material has a small grain size. Also, it has more defect compared to the material produced from HGO. And to study the defect in any carbon material, we need to learn that from Raman. So we bring from Raman, where actually we can immediately see that from the ID over IG, ID, the D peak is the defect peak and the G peak is the graphite peak where from the ratio we can conclude how much this material is defected. So looking to the HGO and IGO, we have seen that there is a higher ratio in case of HGO, which indicate uh, our observation in, in XRD, this material has more uh, density of defect compared to the HGO. And this is applied also to the reduced material. It was um, more defected than the material produced from HG. Uh, looking to the XPS, actually, it has been also confirmed that the IGO material is more oxidized compared to the HGO. And after the reduction from XPS, we have confirmed that all the material um, uh, reduced to reduce the graphene oxide. However, the reduction degree was um, a slight difference between, uh, between reduction method and another method. What we have done actually here, we have collect all the, uh, the reduced graphene oxide material that we have obtained, and we have applied it for supercapacitor application. What we have found here, in general, the material that produced from IGO has higher capacitance than the material produced from HGO. And more specifically, looking to the IGO material, we found that the hydrazine or the chemical reduction and the hydrothermal reduction of IGO exhibited a higher capacitance compared to the uh, other reduction method. So in order to improve this material more and to study more this material, we need to select one of them to further enhance the properties of the material. So the selection between the hydrothermal and the hydrazine actually was not too difficult since by using hydrazine, we are using toxic material to reduce uh, graphene oxide. While in the hydrothermal reduction, we are using only water and we are reducing at 180 degrees. So we have decided to go uh, with the hydrothermal reduction method in order to further uh, enhance the material and to maximize the capacitance of the material. So what we can learn from here by optimizing the oxidation step of graphite and then the reduction step of graphite, we have 10 times more capacitance, which is, uh, haven't been discussed before in the literature. So this brings to us the question, if we can do better than that, but at the same time as a carbon people, we want to keep it only carbon without any additional func functionalization to eliminate the cost of the material and also we, 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 without adding any particle or adding any additional synthesis step to. So just keep it as a symbol as we can. So this draw our attention. So we have focused on the oxidation and the reduction step. What is remaining for us is the post synthesis step. When we, have, when we obtain our material, we will immediately dry the material. So this point haven't been discussed in the literature as well. So we, try, we, we look into the literature and we see that when you obtain your uh, 
synthesized material, either you dry it using vacuum or open air drying, or even you can use freeze drying to use your powder material. Where here, our motivation was from the biological specimen, actually. Where in order uh, to image or the, uh, to, um, to make electro, uh, electro microscopy imaging for any biological specimen, you need to remove all the water in order to subject, uh, to subject the sample to the SCM. However, you need to reveal the 3D structure of the biological specimen to see all these details that we are seeing here. So how they do that? They dry the material at the critical point, where at the critical point, uh, the surface tension is zero. So the water can be removed from the sample without destroying or collab collabing the structure. And this is what we need in graphene. We want to remove the water. At the same time, we, uh, we reserve the separation of the graphite that we did during the oxidation and the reduction. And this is actually the main issue with the graphene synthesis, because we have collapse of, uh, of the graphene whenever we dry the material, which means we are losing the surface area and we are losing the porosity, which will uh, reduce the properties of the material. The question now again is how to do this in chemistry because the biological specimen, it's a stand by itself. You can subject it to the chamber uh, under very high vacuum and you collect your sample without losing the sample. Now we are working here in powder material under very high vacuum. So there is a huge chance that we lose the powder under the vacuum. And the other concern, not only saving the powder material, we want to subject it to the chemical vapor, uh, 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 to the critical point drying. At the same time, we don't change the structure or, the, or we don't have any chemical changes. So we have the same material, but uh, only dry. So for this, uh, I have designed the sample holder that can be subjected uh, to the uh, CBD machine. Uh, and this uh, sample holder is made of Teflon and a very small uh, bars um, mesh where it can allow the CBD process. At the same time, it saves the powder material. So this is the CBD material or the uh, machine or the critical point drying machine where we subject our synthesized reduced graphene oxide or graphene oxide and then we start the process of the critical point drying and then finally we collect for the first time, the reduced graphene oxide, which is dried using critical point dry. And uh, this is actually our strategy where we oxidize, oxidize uh, the graphite and then we reduce it and then uh, we introduce the new method, but also we need to compare it with the existing method in order to validate our method. So we, we actually, uh, have dried the material using freeze drying and vacuum drying to, to see whether our uh, new method is effective or not. So this is what we have. We have synthesized one batch of graphene and then we divide it into uh, graphene oxide. We divide into three parts and then uh, we vacuum dry it, freeze dry it or the uh, CBD drying. And then we reduce it using hydrothermal, the method that we are focusing on. And then after that, we dry it with the respective drying method. And actually, from the visual looking uh, of the sample, with the same weight of the sample, we can see that the CBD met uh, drying method occupied more volume compared to the vacuum dried method with the same mass, which means this material has a higher surface area compared to the vacuum material. And this we can actually see it um, under the electron microscopy, where we can see the vacuum or the freeze dryer. Um, uh, has a compact uh, structure where here we have a must separation of the uh, graphite basal plane. So by using this method, we have uh, revealed the thre 3D structure of the uh, reduced graphene oxide, so we don't have any collapse. And from preforming XRD and XBS, we have confirmed that we don't have any structure or chemical changes. So all the materials are reduced graphene oxide. The difference only is the separation of the graphite basal plane. Where actually the main difference between the material, we can see it here preforming the into 
uh, sorption analysis, where actually the CBD material exhibited the mesoporous structure with, um, with uh, a pore size about 20 nanometer compared to the microporous structure about one nanometer of the uh, reduced graphene oxide that dried using vacuum or freeze dryer, which means this material has, the pores has been collapsed and shrink uh, uh, using this classical drying method. And one other uh, finding that we have is the CBD material has a 360 square meter per gram compared to about only 40 square meter per gram in case of the normal drying method. And this is actually was uh, the highest surface area reported for the hydrothermal reduced graphene oxide. And we can relate that due to uh, the several stresses that the material, when we uh, subject it to vacuum or freeze dryer, we are subjecting our material to the surface tension. So the material lead to collapse during the, the water removal. However, at the, uh, uh, the zero tension, um, as, uh, as the zero surface tension using the critical point dryer, we can remove the water without any collapse or any subject, uh, 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 without subjecting our material uh, to any uh, collapse or stresses. So we applied the new material, the new dried material and supercapacitor as well. And we can see that uh, the CBD material actually exhibited two time capacitance compared to the vacuum and freeze dry method. And also this material has exhibited very good stability. So what we have learned again from here is that by optimizing the synthesis um, steps, which is the oxidation and the reduction, and on top of that, by paying attention to the drying step, which is the post synthesis step, we have 18 times better capacitance, which will draw the carbon community attention to pay attention how to select the oxidation and the reduction and the post synthesis procedure depend on the application. And also, uh, this uh, capacitance obtained here, it was the highest reported capacitance for hydrothermal reduced graphene oxide in the literature. So actually, this is, was our, uh, my motivation to work in MIT, where I started with this sample, since after understanding the impact of synthesis uh, method on graphene oxide, and then also I applied the, the two uh, uh, graphene oxide method that I obtained for CO2 capture. I'm, I'm not going to explain this. I'm just showing that we have applied it for CO2 capture and we found that the IGO material has better uh, uh, CO2 uptake compared to the HGO. And also I have applied it for magnetic resonance and uh, by adding nanoparticles. And I have found that the material brought it from IGO has better performance than the material applied from HGO. And also we apply this for supercapacitor and uh, paying attention to the post synthesis. And again, in general, the IGO material exhibited better performance in different application as you see. Uh, so this was my aim to draw all the carbon community attention from using the classical Hammers method to use the improved uh, Hammers method. Uh, here in, uh, in MIT, actually, I work in vanadium redox flow battery, which is another application to further confirm the hypothesis that the IGO material and the post synthesis uh, uh, step is very important to focus on. So uh, in vanadium redox flow battery, um, actually, uh, it's one of the, of, of the um, interesting uh, application because this kind of battery has a large capacitance, long life cycle, and also a fast response time. And the vanadium redox battery actually is limited by the positive side reaction, where uh, beside the electron transfer, we have hydrogen and uh, water, uh, which make the positive side is uh, uh, all the uh, vanadium redox battery limited by the positive side reaction. And this is why, actually, we need to develop an electrode 
that assist the kinetic uh, of the vanadium redox battery in order to have better performance. And actually, carbon fills used as electrode uh, in uh, vanadium redox battery usually because it has outstanding mechanical strength um, and high intrinsic stability in the acid media. However, uh, it has uh, some drawbacks, for example, low device efficiency, which uh, lead to have the scientist to decorate the carbon fills using a noble metal and the noble metal uh, actually highly cost method to assist the kinetic of uh, the vanadium redox battery. As an alternative, we can uh, decorate the carbon fills using graphene or reduce graphene oxide which will provide excellent conductivity, large specific area, and also it's inert in a very uh, acidic condition. So we see that the graphene is, is a very good candidate to apply in the vanadium redox spectrum. So the strategy here is to know that whether uh, the surface area will have an impact um, in the vanadium redox spectrum as we have a very high surface area in the CBD material compared to low surface area uh, in case of uh, vacuum drying. Also, another, uh, another point that we need to study is the porosity, since we know that uh, the CBD exhibited the mesoporous material, while the vacuum one exhibited the microporous material. So we have a variety in the surface area and the porosity, so we can study um, the two conditions at the same time. Also, we have studied uh, if we thermally treated the carbon filled substrate before the addition of the uh, reduced graphene oxide on the carbon filled, whether it will enhance the electrochemical performance or not. So, we have deposited our graphene uh, on the carbon filled, either using CBD graphene or vacuum graphene. And we have confirmed the deposition of the material from CM and from Raman as well. And we have studied the electrochemical surface area of both the uh, CBD graphene and then the vacuum graphene. As we can see, the carbon filled alone has very low surface area. Uh, and we can read that from the current, where the vacuum exhibited higher current than, um, than the carbon filled, where the maximum current obtained using uh, the CBD material. What is surprising here, when we uh, look into the surface area of CBD material and vacuum material, we can see the electrochemical surface area here is similar. It's not so different. Again, when we thermally treat the carbon filled and then deposit the, carbon, uh, the graphene on the carbon filled, we have seen that the surface area, the electrochemical surface area is uh, comparable. This is give us indication that we are eliminating the fact of uh, the different surface area since the electrochemical surface area is the same. And what we are studying here is the impact of the porosity of the material, whether it's the micropores or the mesopores will affect uh, our electrochemical performance. Applying the vacuum material and then the CBD material we can see that the CBD in red exhibited better electrochemical performance than the vacuum one. Also, in terms of resistance, the resistance was lower in case of um, CBD compared to the vacuum one. Uh, here, what we have done to, uh, to further optimize uh, our study, we make first deposition on the carbon field with a certain concentration and then to eliminate uh, the fact that if we add more material, we will have more electrochemical performance. So we have uh, uh, addition um, of the second deposition on the carbon filled. And what we have learned from here, that the second addition has a very slight improvement than the, uh, the first deposition, which means that we can stick the, to the first deposition without usage of more material. So we can lower the concentration or lower the amount of the material that we are using. So we went to thermally treated the carbon filled substrate before the deposition of graphene and we study the CBD 
uh, electrochemical preformance where we can see that when we thermally treat the, car uh, the carbon pilt, the CBD has exhibited more um, electrochemical response compared to the pristine carbon pilt. And also we can see the resistance has uh, uh, minimized. Also, we study the rate and the stability of the material applying different current, and we can see this, uh, this material exhibited a very good columbic efficiency. And in terms of stability, the material was very good, uh, uh, shows very good stability uh, up to 100 cycle with very good columbic efficiency, as we can see here. So what we can learn from this project is that when we apply the vacuum graphene and then applying the CBD graphene, we have enhanced the electrochemical response. And on top of that, after thermally treated the substrate, we have further maximized the electrochemical performance of the material. And this actually uh, drive our attention of, of we can further maximize our electrochemical performance and in, the, in this time, going green and using biomass also as a carbon person, keep it only carbon without any functionalization or any addition of particles. And this takes us to the second project, which is um, making graphene from the, um, the bound dead seeds. As uh, we know, Saudi Arabia is one of the world leading countries growing fresh dates. So, uh, if, we, if I'm thinking of biomass, I would go for, for dates immediately to synthesize, uh, obtain carbon from dates. So we start from date and then we hydrothermally carbonize it. We obtain carbon and then after that, we activate the carbon using either CO2 or KOH or phosphoric acid activation in order to have the porous material that can be applied for electrochemical application. So the goal here is to have a very high surface area material that brought greenly from uh, the dates or biomass. And then again, we study the, the effect of the porosity in the uh, vanadium redox uh, flow battery. So this is uh, briefly the synthesis procedure. We start with date, we hydrothermally carbonize it, and then we have uh, the carbon material. And then after that, we activate, and then we have the activated carbon uh, the very porous and high, highly surface area activated carbon where we can see uh, the surface area, it's reached up to 2,300 square meter per gram, which is a very good surface area brought it from um, biomass. And uh, I started with these two samples. The aim was comparing all the, the material, but due to COVID, I just uh, uh, studied this two material. And then when we... Uh, Characterize the material, we can see that depend on the activation process, for example, CO2, KOH, and phosphoric acid, the material uh, morphology changed, and then the, the maximum porosity, we can see it, uh, and the maximum rough surface, which indicate higher surface area, we can see it from KOH. Um, and looking to the interruption analysis, we can see that this material exhibited different uh, surface texture information. For example, some of this material is microborse material, some of them is mesoborse material. However, uh, this, uh, this material has a mesoborse nature, but not all of the material has similar uh, porosity uh, nature. For example, the BDS8 has uh, uh, the maximum uh, mesoborse uh, population compared to other material. So what we are studying here, the BDS8 and BDS9, where they have really different um, porosity information. We apply this for uh, vanadium redox uh, flow battery, and we found that compared to the pristine carbon pilt, the substrate that we are using, we have a very good uh, electrochemical response. And also um, here we can see that the, uh, the resistance has been uh, decreased. Uh, looking to the second material, which is uh, phosphoric acid uh, activation, we can see that this material as well 
uh, has, a, has a better performance compared to the carbon filter, but not compared to the uh, BDS-8. And then we thermally treated, uh, following uh, the procedure, we thermally treated the carbon filter before we deposit our material. And we can see that there is an enhancement, further enhancement. Um, if we can compare, for example, here, BDS-9, it's about 180. And here it's approaching to 250 uh, power density, which uh, means that we have enhanced uh, the electrochemical response of uh, this activated uh, carbon material. And as a conclusion from these two projects, actually, from the first one, we have learned that by applying, uh, by paying attention uh, to the synthesis uh, uh, conditions and to the post synthesis procedure. Uh, we successfully have a very good electrochemical response in redox flow battery. And then uh, by using uh, a biomass that brought it from the, the bulb dead seeds, uh, we have a very good electrochemical response um, for vanadium redox flow battery. Uh, actually, post IBK, as Professor Fick mentioned that, I just get promoted as a Dean of Scientific uh, research in the whole university. So I'm moving to Hafrabad and from Nariya. Uh, so uh, also here, I would like to especially thank Professor Fick to give me this opportunity to join his group and learn from ev every member in his group and uh, under his supervision and guideline. I have learned um, a, a very good knowledge uh, during this uh, fellowship. And also I would like to thank Kara and Charles and Professor group. Also, I would like to thank Professor Bidru for sending me the sample that I have synthesized while I was in Kaos. Uh, thank uh, University of Hafrul Batin and I wouldn't be in MIT without IBK, so I would like to thank you, Professor Kemal, Teresa, Dorkri, and Nadia, and everyone in IBK. Uh, thank you so much for giving me, uh, giving me this opportunity, and thank you all for being here and uh, listening to, to my speech. I will go to the chat. Thank you so much. I will go to the chat. I would see if there is any questions. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, Amira. And I just sent another reminder, even though you prefaced this the webinar, that all um, attendees can submit questions through the Zoom chat feature. Just type them in, and Amira will answer them. Thank you, uh, Amira. And, uh, Maybe I'll take a minute to introduce to the participants, uh, you know, uh, the team that makes IBK work. Uh, there is uh, Theresa Worth uh, and also Dorothy uh, Hanna uh, and Nadia uh, Shahid. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the uh, yeah, this is a great presentation. Uh, thank you, Amira, and congratulations on you uh, on your new position. Um, I'm looking also at the chats. Maybe I can ask a question, you know, while we are waiting for the for the chat. This is not my area, by the way. So uh, it it seemed that one of the uh, key things that you emphasize in obtaining like super capacitor um, uh, performance, you know, was the uh, the large uh, area that uh, you know one gets. Is that correct from the process? Um, so, yeah, if, if this is the case, um, uh, so what is uh, happening is that uh, like the, the, for the area to be larger, um, is there like are there pores that are being formed in the material or what is going on, you know, physically that is, you know, increasing, you know, this, uh, uh, this area? Thank you, Professor Kaban, for the question. Okay, so this is all about enhancing the electrochemical performance. If we think of graphite before oxidized and reduce it, if you look to the very close and book, and it's a very, um, very huge book, the graphite. You can think of a graphite. It's each page of this book. Mm -hmm. So, whenever, if you are opening the book or opening the the, the spaces between the books, you uh, you are allowing the ions to enter between the pages, which mm -hmm. means you are allowing uh, the, the ions to access between the graphite layers, which, me, which means you are accessing more surface area, 
you are accessing more conductivity. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I think there is a question. Uh, what kind of defects are you expected to have in your materials? Yeah, I will. I will go to to Raman and I will explain the defects. Actually, the defects here can be defined into into two stages. The first stage when we synthesize uh, the graphene oxide from graphite. Uh, okay, okay. So this is Raman. Actually, the first stage when we uh, we have graphite. So as you can see here, there is no defect peak in graphite. After that, we are introducing a functional group by making the, uh, the graphene oxide. We are introducing epoxy or H group. So we are making defect by introducing functional group. So we are um, adding more sp2, uh, uh, sp3, sorry, sp3. As we know, graphite all sp2. So we are adding SB, uh, SB3 carbon. So this is the defect. After the reduction, we are removing all the function group. So what, what, uh, what we can define the defects here by the vacancies that occur in the graphene oxide after the removal, the harsh removal of the uh, oxygen function group from graphene oxide. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I answered the question. Another question there? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll read it just for the purposes of a recording so our future guests can hear it. Um, so for the material that was prepared with the dates, which are around the micro size, is there a, w a work in progress to decrease that to nano size to increase the surface area and other properties? Okay. Uh, here I will just define the micro size um, okay, the micro size, I mean one nanometer to two nanometer, and then the meso uh, size from two nanometer to 25 nanometer, and then the macro size from 25 to 50 nanometer. So we are speaking about nano size bores. Actually, it's a very, very small uh, porosity, which is from zero to, to two nanometer, actually. So this is the, the lowest uh, pores that you can get from this material. Maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, the, uh, maybe this was in slide 29 or 30, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. You know, where you had the curves, like current versus uh, uh, potential. Yeah. Uh, 29. You can just press 29, type 29 okay. and return. You are in present. Yeah, these, uh, yeah this slide here. So, yeah, so here, you know, you're, you're plotting, you know, current, you know, versus the potential, right? Um, yeah. And then in all of these plots, there is some behavior that looks to me as a, as a hysteresis effect or a hysteresis uh, phenomenon. Um, uh, so if that, if that is the case, so that means in this process, there are uh, losses, right? There is dissipation and loss of um, uh, energy or, uh, and so, and then the wider these loops are, the thicker or the fatter they are, the more losses there are, or there is in the, the more loss is in the process. And then the thinner they are, the slim, you know, that means less uh, losses. Uh, is this my understanding correct? in reading these graphs or is there something else going on? Okay, I um, actually mean the hysteresis here between these lines. So, so these graphs, you know, uh, to me they okay. show like a hysteresis loop. So for example, you have the potential at zero. So then mm -hmm. you increase it, let's say all the way to 0.2. So it goes along one curve. And then you start decreasing, it goes not, you know, the way it came, it comes back from another direction. And then you go negative from zero to minus 0.2, and then it continues that way. And then now you start increasing. And so in, if it was a straight line or like it was just one curve, right? So that means there's no, you know, losses or no hysteretic uh, phenomenon. 
But when okay. they move like this, when we plot uh, current, and these, uh, we call them conjugate uh, variables, a current and a potential, right? Then you have these uh, losses. Is that uh, what is happening here or something else? Okay, well, uh, I think what is happening here is something else in terms of how we can read this one. This is the current, as long as, if you call it hysteresis, as, as we have it, uh, larger hysteresis, we have a large current, which means we have more conductivity, we have more accessibility of the electrolyte to reach the electrode, mm -hmm. which means we have a better electrochemical response. However, the behavior here, for example, if we look to the black line here, uh, uh, what we are changing here is the scan rate. By means that we are scanning from slow scan rate to mm -hmm. 200, which is very high scan rate. Yeah. When you are scanning slowly, so you have time to the, to the reaction to occur. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the great capacitance behavior, which is the black one. Whenever you are increasing the scan rate as a kinetic factor, you don't have really time to, to the reaction to occur. So this is why it's moving, uh, giving you this eye shape. And the uh, and what you're applying is uh, uh, is also is the potential. Yeah, the potential. And, and it goes and from okay. minus point two to plus point two. Yeah, here. we go like this. We go like this as a circle. So each one, each line, it's a different experiment. And, the, and you're measuring the current, like in this case. Or we are measuring. We are applying potential, and we are measuring the current. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you may want to look into this uh, because this is in uh, electro, uh, electrical uh, systems uh, or a system that has this kind of behavior. It, it means that there are some losses uh, uh, in, in that process. Yeah, dissipation. Yeah, if we, can, if we consider it as the losses, it's due to the, the fast kinetic of the reaction that we don't have a really time to, for the reaction to occur. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I have a question, Mira. Please. You mentioned that this might be um, processing, the date seeds might be a way of getting uh, green energy storage. And I was wondering if uh, um, the side effects or the other materials that are produced by processing the date seeds to get the graphene from them, like what, what does that create? Like uh, what byproducts? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, we can't really call like whenever we are doing synthesis, we can't have a, a hundred percent a green process. However, when we are making graphene oxide from the natural graphite, we are using acids, we are using oxidizing agent, uh, which is a very harsh uh, to the environment. Uh, while we are uh, starting from uh, having carbon from the dates, we are starting from the waste of the of the material from the biomass and then we we are uh, carbonized what would be the the um, the harsh byproduct here when we activate the uh, the carbon using koh or phosphoric acid this would be uh, a harsh to the environment somehow yes thank you very good yeah um, i had a question too um, and perhaps I missed this in the talk because I do not have the technical background to hang with all of this. Um, but I was really Im impressed with this new graphene um, development process that you have created. And I think what you were saying is that you sort of were testing it with some um, sort of existing processes. But I was wondering if um, given the um, the, the, the better properties of this new graphene, does that suggest applications that maybe were not possible with the previous methods? Or how do you think this will enable people to use the graphene di in different ways? Um, actually, is, um, is not to apply graphene to, to application that graphene has never been applied for it. Graphene applied for most of the application, However, it's just enhance the, uh, the properties in a way that, for example, if I want to microporse the graphene, I would dry the graphene using vacuum drying. If I, if I would like to have a mesoporse graphene, I would go with the CBD drying process. And this actually, um, I can uh, tell you two applications where you can select. For example, if you are working in lithium-ion battery, you would definitely go with drying graphene using vacuum 
because you want microbores, which is a very small uh, bores, uh, because in lithium, the lithium ions are very small, so we, you don't need the, the mesobore structure. While you are working in supercapacitor, you are working with large ions, for example, SO4, uh, so you need a mesobore structure. So this is to allow the scientists to design the material depend on the application. If they are working in supercapacitor, in, my, in uh, lithium ion battery, in, uh, uh, in vanadium redox battery, so for, for the scientists to select the synthesis procedure depend on the application needs. Got it, thank you. That, yeah, that's really helpful and exciting. Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Very good, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, so if there are no more questions, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Amira, for the great presentation, for your new position and your responsibilities. Uh, and uh, we also thank Dr. Bouchet, uh, you know, for uh, supervising your work and being with you, you know, for all this time. And uh, we hope that uh, you and uh, Professor Bouchette and his team, that you can continue, you know, your relationship in the, in the research and collaboration in, uh, in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we will, I think, we'll make announcement for another seminar sometime later. Is that correct, uh, Nadia? Stay tuned for more. <laughs> it is. We have a seminar series coming up, which we'll be announcing and publicizing, um, as well as individual IBK fellow um, seminars that they will be presenting. But we have a seminar series coming up that we'd love everyone to participate in. So look out for announcements, please. <laughs>